section this evening in the book of Hebrews chapter 5. We are almost halfway gone in our study of this powerful book, the book of Hebrews. And thank you for taking the time to join us as we study his word. The Bible tells us your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Your word have I stored in my soul that I may not sin against you. Sanctify them with your word, for your word is the truth. Let us bow our heads as we ask God to open our eyes to his truth. Holy God, we bow before your throne with humble hearts, recognizing that you are the awesome God of the universe. We know for sure that every breath we take comes from you. And we don't want to take it for granted, realizing that a good number of people went to bed last night with the hope of waking up this morning, and they didn't. But for us, you have seen fit to extend yet another day to, for us, to us. And so we are grateful. We want to study your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit will open our eyes to your truth. Use the study this evening and make it a source of blessing and challenge. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We are continuing again in the fifth chapter of the book of Hebrews. The fifth chapter of the book of Hebrews. And turn with me to the fifth chapter. And we're going to be dealing with three verses, and these three verses is so crucial. This, they are so crucial. This section in general is a, is a, is one of the pivotal sections or chapters that we'll be dealing with in the book of Hebrews, verses eight through 10. These three verses, Read with me, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of internal salvation. Being designated by God as a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Like I said, again, we're only going to look, examine these three verses. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. If you need a topic, you can write one. Maturing through suffering. Maturing through suffering. Everybody wants to mature. Every if you if you are a parent and you have a you have a child or children you want their you want your children to mature or your child to mature and that is the fact of life because once you have a mature individual around it, 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 it's such a, a a warm feeling to have someone who is matured in your periphery or in your cycle. Maturity is expressed in so many ways. Maturity is expressed in how you conduct yourself, what you do, how you deal with other people. Uh, maturity is just some, it's not just something we, we, that comes so easily. Maturity in everything, whether it be in any, every, in every, any field of life, in every field of life, maturity is so important. You want to have matured, if you're a business owner, you want to have people who are matured in your business to deal with the, the exigency of daily activities. Maturity also is important in the plan of God. God uses matured individuals to accomplish his purpose. He uses prepared vessels, if you would, to accomplish his purpose. 
make no mistake, God doesn't just use anything that he sees out there. Right, he does. But if God picks you up, regardless of how you are, what you are, what, what, the first thing he will do is to prepare you, to prepare you so that you can be adequately used by him. And that's why Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is God breed. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that a man of God might be matured, might be matured. You see the process, all scripture, which means from Genesis to Revelation, all scripture is God breed. Every iota that you find in the Bible is the handwork of God. All scriptures, God breed. It is profitable for doctrine. In other words, doctrine is taking the whole nuances, taking the whole judge in the Bible and make a doctrine out of it, biblical teaching. That's what Paul is saying. All scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. The word of God reproves us and helps us, conditions us. Uh, the, the word of God is our spanking, it's our spanking stick, it's our whip. It reproves us when we are wrong. When we are when we err, it reproves us. The word of God reproves us. And so that's what Paul is saying. It is profitable for reproof for correction. How many times have you been in error as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ because of false teaching? I I, I was in error before. I may still be in error. Once the word of God is the light of the word of God shines on me, it shines on the on my error, and my job is to correct it right away. Why? Paul tells you so that you may be you may be matured and furnished unto all good works. Matured and furnished unto all good works. They go together. Once you matured, God places you in a position whereby you can be of use to, 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 to advance the work of his kingdom. God uses prepared vessels. Do you want to be used by God? You put yourself to be prepared by him. How? Through the exposure to the teaching of his word. That's what Paul meant in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The word of God does that, prepares you and presents you to be used by God in a way that you will bring glory and honor to his holy name and at the same time prepares you you're able to develop capacity for god to bless you beyond measure and by the way god blesses us not because we bribe him some people tell you either in the church or in, on television especially give god we multiply give god does that god doesn't god is not in the multiplication business it's not in a stock market. God is not a trade by butter. You give me, I, I multiply. It's not like that kind of God. He's a God who deals with us on the basis of grace. He gives us on the basis of our capacity. God cannot give you more than you can handle, either by the way of suffering or by way of blessing. That is true even in the family. A, a, a father cannot give a, a child more than he or she can handle. And that is true in life. It's true with God also. And so maturing through suffering, that is the topic that we want to examine this evening. We have already read uh, in, in this uh, chapter, in these three verses, although he was a son, I like the way Leon Morris, one of the authoritative, uh, one of the, uh, the scholars with authority on the scripture, he, he said it this way, quote, son though he was, son though he was. He's just not trying to tell you although he was a son. No, son though he, he was. Let me bring it in such a way you will understand what he's trying to tell us or what he's trying to say here. He's saying, imagine, imagine, consider. 
he was a son. He was the son of God. That's, look at your verse 8 again. Although he was a son, this is the way you ought to read it. Consider, imagine, think about it. He was the son of God. He was the son of God. And in other words, even though he was the son of God, even though he was a son, he still went through suffering. He still learned obedience. And so although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered, from the things which he suffered. This is a mystery. As God, God never learned any obedience. God never learned obedience. <laughs> That's funny. Who is he to obey? In the in heavens, and all angels obey him. But fallen and elect angels, they obey him. So who else can God obey? So he has never experienced obedience as God. This is this is a mystery beyond our comprehension. In order to experience obedience, he had to become a human. He put on humanity so that he can experience obedience. And where does he get obedience from? From subjecting himself to the authority of the Father. You cannot have obedience if there is not authority. No obedience, no authority. And so Jesus Christ had to put on humanity. As we are told in, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and, 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 and uh, upward, Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although existed in the form of God, does not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but yet became a man. So Jesus Christ added humanity to his deity. Why? That's what we're learning here, that he will experience, we already learned in the previous chapters, why he became a man, that he will identify, he will be able to identify with what we're going through. As God, even though he knows all these things by, by being omniscient, but by experience, he had never experienced anybody punching him, anybody spitting upon him or spitting on him. He has never experienced all these things as God. Only as man, he was able to experience being punched, ridiculed, uh, maligned, judged, and so many other things he experienced in his humanity. Uh, and they also, when you read, when it, it, this is parallel to Luke 252, it says he learned obedience through the things he saw. Um, no, I'm sorry, in Luke 252, the, 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 the boy Jesus grew in wisdom and in knowledge. He grew. He can never say that of God. God never grows. It's infinite. It's unchangeable. It's immutable. God is unchangeable. God doesn't change. But as man, yes, he had to grow. All the knowledge he acquired, he, he got all those knowledge by learning, just as you and I are doing this evening. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. And it's very interesting. God elected to use suffering as a means of maturing his son. He learned obedience from the things which he suffered. In other words, the, he learned, he, he, he was not disobedient in the first to begin with. He just, by obeying the mandate of the father, he was experiencing what it means to obey. It wasn't all that uh, easy for him. I, will, I can assure you that it wasn't easy for him to obedience or obedience, I just obey, nothing. No, it was, not, it was not easy for him. We saw that in the Gethsemane when he restored with obedience 
that led to the cross. He has struggled. And that's an exposure of humanity that he experienced. So that when you are struggling in obeying the mandates of the scripture, he can be right there with you, knowing that he too knew what it meant to go through obeying that which often is difficult. He learned obedience through the things he suffering. God brought suffering upon his life to help him learn this obedience, to help him learn the obedience. In verse 9, and having been made perfect, when you read that word, you think that Jesus was once imperfect, and then suddenly God made him perfect. No. That word, teleo in Greek, means having been made mature. It, it, perfection is not in the sense of sinless perfect, perfection, rather mature, maturity, having been made mature. He became to all those who obey him the source of internal salvation. He became to all those who obey him the source of internal salvation. Uh, so you mark having been made perfect. Again, remember that word perfect has nothing to do with sinless perfection, rather maturity, having been made mature. He learned obedience. The suffering in his life helped him as he moves in his humanity to the obedience to the plan of God, obeying it, Jesus Christ was able to advance rapidly to the level of spiritual maturity. As man, he had to be matured. God uses prepared vessels. As God, mature for what? He's God. He knows it all. Remember when Jesus Christ tried to make the decision between his human knowledge and divine knowledge, the disciples already told, told us in, in our study in the book of John, in chapter 2 and elsewhere, they say, you know all things. In, in fact, when, last Sunday when we spoke about Jesus asking Philip, where will we get money or where will we get bread to feed these people? In that passage, we read Jesus knew what he would do. That's omniscient. In his omniscient, he knew that he already knew that in the crowd there's, there's bread that he will multiply. But Philip didn't know that. And so that's his de deity part of him. But in his humanity, remember he was asked, Lord, his disciples asked him, when will you, when will the time be? He, he answered them, the son of man does not know the time or the hour. Was he lying? No. He said the son of man. A son of money doesn't know, but as God, he obeyed. He knew the exact nanosecond when the end would be. But he didn't tell them a son of God, otherwise they will all go on vacation and wait until the time, when the time is, everybody will start getting ready in the spiritual life. If we know that Jesus will not come this year or in the next 20 years, I can assure you, you won't be in Bible class. There are other things to do. Just at the right, one month left, You'll be the most righteous, most serious believer ever lived. Because you know that in, in the one month, Jesus will return. So he doesn't tell us. He simply tells them, the son of man does not know. In the, in the same way, he, he makes a distinction between his deity and his humanity. When he said in John chapter 10, verse 30, the father and I are one. The father and I are one. But when he goes, to John chapter 14, John chapter 14, I believe is anywhere around there, verse 20. Let me see if I find verse 28 or so. John chapter 14. Jesus Christ is going to tell them exactly in verse 28, John 14, 28, the last part. I go to the Father. For the father is greater than I. The father is greater than I. Is he lying? When he said that he and the father are one in essence, in, in 30 verse, in, in, in uh, 1030, then here he's telling you the father is greater than, than I. The Jehovah witnesses, they see, they see that they say, ah, you see, 
Jesus, the Father is greater than Jesus. No, what he's saying here is that in my humanity, in my human nature, the Father is greater than I. But in my deity, I am equal to the Father. I'm equal with the Father in my deity. And that's very important to, to, take, uh, to take note of. Again, back in, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, and having been made perfect, it is God that made him perfect. It's God that matured, that matured, matured him. It is, this is uh, the arrows participle passive. In, in, a, in a moment of time, Jesus Christ was prepared and set forth to be an offering for our salvation. Could you imagine Satan would have eaten him alive had he not been prepared? When he met with Satan, the same way Satan met Eve and Adam in the garden, and they fell, they met the last Adam. He, did not, he didn't succumb to the temptation. Pretty much the same temptation Satan took to Eve was the same duplication of temptation that Satan brought to Jesus. Remember, to Eve, it was fruit. Food, food. Look at that fruit. How beautiful that fruit. Take and eat. The same thing, the first temptation Jesus presented Satan with, Satan presented Jesus with, that stone, turn it into bread. You see, the same uh, concept. Uh, what about uh, uh, Jesus? Uh, Satan telling Jesus to bow before him, to bow, and he'll give him the kingdom of this world. The same temptation was presented to Eve that, uh, first of all, you're going to be like God. You're gonna be like God. You're gonna, you, you, in fact, you'll be wise as God is. So you look at the similarity of the temptation. But Jesus was prepared. God didn't send, set him forth, not when he was 18 years old, 20 years old. We're talking about 30 years old. And throughout that 30 years old, what, what was he doing? Studying the word of God, living. When he said, man shall not live on bread alone, Jesus Christ was preparing himself through the scripture, learning, learning and growing in grace. And that's why he said in Luke 2.52, he grew in knowledge and in wisdom. And so by growing and maturing through the suffering and things he, 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 he encountered, Jesus was able to be an offering for our sins, he was able to withstand Satan in every angle. And remember how he would, how he withstood Satan. He didn't withstand Satan by these modern, modern sayings or these terminologies or the things that we do today. I command you, Satan. I rebuke you. I cast you into abyss. I sit upon you. I stand upon you. That doesn't mean anything to Satan. How did Jesus withstand Satan? It is written, it is written. He used the power of the word of God to defeat Satan. Why would anyone try something different? What Jesus has tested, the pioneer and the author of our faith has tested what works, the word of God. And today we resort to so many things, binding Satan, casting him into abyss, and so many other things that don't mean anything as far as the Bible is concerned. Why are we being defeated? Because we have resorted to use any convention than what Jesus Christ himself used. And so he learned obedience through the things he suffered. And having been made perfect, God was able to make him to be the source of internal life. The word obey here, some scholars have some, uh, some uh, Thoughts, what that could mean, obey, obey him, the source of internal salvation. Obeying here doesn't mean unless you're obeying Jesus Christ, you cannot have internal life. Not, 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 we know that salvation is not based on your obedience, 
to the mandates or obedience. That obedience is synonymous to believe, faith, those who have faith in him, those who have faith in him. The, that word is also used in another passage. Turn with me to Second Thessalonians. The same word, the same Greek word, is used in relation to salvation in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. We ought to always to give thanks. This is Paul writing to the, to the Thessalonians. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each of you toward one another grows ever greater. What a testimony that the love that you have for one another grows. Can that be said of you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is your love for your fellow believer growing? Is it growing or dwindling? And that's Paul praises the church here. Verse 4, therefore we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Who says that suffering is not meant for church or for believers? Read that passage. These are believers who are growing in grace. They are applying the word of God. Their love for each other is growing even greater by the day. And yet they faced affliction. They faced persecution. And they, but in the midst of all, they persevere, as Paul tells us in verse 5. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you, for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repair with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Flaming fire, a reference to judgment. Look at verse 8, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey. The same Greek word we found in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. How do you obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus? Jesus is simply by believing, by believing the good news. And to these people who will face calamity, are those who do not believe the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And those will pay the penalty of internal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That's simply what it means, internal separation from God for all eternity. And so obey here, you can interpret it or it can be doer or just make it doer. One, in reference to your salvation. Salvation is not by keeping the law, not by improving your life, not by changing anything. Salvation is simply trust, believe, have confidence in the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. Faith alone, in Christ alone, that sets you apart. When you wanna give a birth to a child, you don't give, a, you don't give any condition. If you, if you don't, Tell me, I haven't seen a mother that is about to give a child, give a birth to a child, point into her womb and say, baby, unless you promise me you're gonna behave, you're not coming out this evening. That's a joke. The baby, well, you just that's the mother kidding herself. The baby doesn't even hear what you're talking about. When the birth pain comes, the, the mother wants by all means to take this baby out of the womb. So birth is different from growth. Once you are born in the family, you begin the process of growth. And it don't, it don't begin that overnight. It takes time. It starts from milk. From, from milk, uh, the baby begins liquid food. 
immature to solid food and so on and so forth. The same way in the spiritual life, salvation begins by an act of faith in Christ alone. And once you are born in the family of God, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn baby, newborn baby. He didn't call you adult. I don't care how old you are when you are born, even if you are 100 years old, when you are born in the family of God, you are a baby in God's family. And so as newborn baby, desire, desire the sincere, crave, sincere make of the word of God that you may grow thereby. And that's very important in our spiritual life. Principle. Let's put these three important principles down. We're going to write, get ready with your pen and pencil, pen or pencil, and your note. I always encourage you to write if you can, unless you are one of those special people who don't need to write. And yet you ask them what was taught, and they will just tell it to you verbatim. There is one, one out of one million people are like that. But if not, even if you don't write the whole note, just put some passages. If you really want to grow, go home and read those passages. Review them. They will help you in your spiritual work. I, I promise you, I guarantee they will help you. Garbage in, garbage out. What you put in is what you get out. If you, if you are careless, you don't care about studying the word, reading, you're gonna, you're gonna wind up as a believer, as, as weak as you can get. You can never grow and God will never use you. And you wind up as a loser in Christendom. But God doesn't want that. God doesn't want that, neither do I. And so one, the first principle, suffering in itself, does not mature a believer. Suffering in itself does not mature a believer. It is what a believer does with the suffering that can lead to maturity. This is very important. Suffering in itself does not mature a believer. It is what a believer does with the suffering that can lead to maturity. Just because you are suffering doesn't mean you're going to be matured. It's how you handle suffering that can determine whether it will mature you. Two, suffering can humble and draw us close to God. Suffering can, hum can humble and draw us close to God. See, suffering can get you, can humble you, and you just see that you are nobody. You haven't suffered enough, whereby everything has been knocked out of, knocked out of your uh, command post, and you just realize that I am really nobody. Everything you that you've been leaning on, thinking that this is what made you so strong and so so proud of yourself, all of a sudden, God carefully knocks those things out and they just looked around and see that you have nothing left it really humbles you suffering can humble us and draw us close to god three suffering can embitter very important suffering can embitter us and distance us from god embitterment it can it can be bitter by suffering there are people who have abandoned the boat of Christian work because of suffering. They have suffered and they said, if, if, how can God, how can God be God and allow and, and allows me to go through this? How can God be God? They become so bitter. They don't even want to hear anything about God or Bible. They become so bitter against God. That is the result of suffering that is not handled properly. Remember Jesus, who, who even though was God's son, yet he too went through suffering. We have now, we are ready with these three principles, 
we are ready to look into. I have uh, eight points of truth that we need to just write them down. I encourage you to look over them, perhaps before you go to bed, if all possible. One, because we are, we are studying something very, nobody escapes. Nobody escapes suffering. And it's better for you to know something about what you are going through as a believer. One, God uses suffering as a tool in many fronts. God uses suffering as a tool in many fronts or in many ways. One way God uses suffering, we have seen that way is to mature us. He uses that suffering to help us depend on him. Uh, it's just like a, once sickness hits you, you, you may be depending on yourself all your life until a devastating, devastating sickness hits you. You begin to depend on God. You begin to depend on, on, uh, on doctors. You begin to, you, you are no longer, you take yourself out of the box and begin to depend on others. But in this case, God uses suffering to help you, to draw you close to him, to help you look upward. Help me. There are many people who don't even know, who don't even say help me until they are running into difficulty, until they run into suffering. They start looking to God for the first time. There are people who don't read the Bible. There are people who have never read the Bible in their entire life. He made one of them. But once in the hospital bed, they can read the Bible, the whole Bible in one week. Genesis to Revelation. Everything you find them, whenever you, the nurse or the doctor comes in, is the Bible. Is the Bible. They're reading it. They, every chapter they have never read before, they are reading it. They are praying. Suffering, God uses it to bring us to such a place. Another way God uses suffering is for discipline. When we are not, when we are out of line, God will bring suffering as a discipline. Two, suffering is God's way of preparing and perfecting his children for greater service and blessing. You, you're going to like that. Suffering is God's way of preparing and perfecting his children for greater service and blessing. In other words, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you know you have been growing, you are growing in grace, and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you know. And don't you ever tell me that I don't know whether I'm growing or not. You cannot be a believer and don't and don't know whether you're making progress or not. It's not possible. As a believer, you know whether you are retrogressing. Or you are progressing. There is no neutral ground in spiritual life. You cannot be neutral. No, no neutrality in God's program. Either you are going forward or you are going backward. And you cannot tell me, Moses, I don't know whether I'm going forward or backward. No, you're lying. You know. And so, but if you know that you are going forward, you are learning, you are applying, you are the spirit within you is confirming giving you the peace, the joy, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And you're growing in grace and you know that. Suddenly, disaster strikes. Like he did Job. Job knew. That's why Job was defending his ground when he was accused by his friends. His friends told him, the reason why you're going through this is because of your sin. Job said, no, not in a million years. I have not done anything to deserve what I'm getting to. And they, they couldn't believe that a righteous man could get what Job was getting. In fact, Job, God already spoke of Job in Job chapter one, that there's no righteous man like him. And yet, it's, did you see what Job went through? Hell on earth, everything white. All he had worked for his life, taken off, 
just like this. And yet he was a righteous before God. He was a man, if you read the, the passages where he said, where he was trying to present his case, who I have taken care of the widows, I have taken care of the poor, I have placed for those who are weak, I have taken care of the orphanage, orphans, I have, you just see the list. And yet, despite all this, he was ambushed by the en enemy of success. And so you see, suffering can come even to those you think are good, even though no one is good but Jesus Christ. No one is good but God. Have you ever heard people say, how can bad things happen to good people? By the way, who is good? You? <laughs> That's a joke. You good? Oh, wow. I need to meet you. I need, we, know, we need to have lunch. I've never met a good person but God himself. That's what Jesus said. No one is good but God. And so whatever we have, we have because of the grace of God. Again, suffering is God's way of preparing and perfecting his children for greater service and blessing. And you see, Job, Job was, God used that suffering, even though Satan wanted to use the suffering to kill him. Satan wanted to use the suffering to bury Job. Rather, God used the suffering to mature him even more. Job was already a matured believer, but he used the suffering. God used that suffering to turn him, to shine him. That's why even when he was in the furnace, he stuck his neck out of the furnace and told his friends, hey guys, I, I just want you to know, you're looking at me, I'm sweating, I'm bleeding, I'm oozing. Everywhere, you can, I'm, I'm in the oven. What do you think? But let me tell you one thing. God knows the way that I take. He knows what I'm going through. When he has tried me, when he has tested me like a gold, I shall comfort as gold. What a confidence from a person who knows his God. As Daniel tells us that those who know their God will work strong and do great exploit. Those who know their God, not everybody knows their God. Otherwise that passage would be invalid. Those who know their God. Job was, was one of them. He was always looking unto God, knowing that God knows the reason why everything he has given me was taken away. He never blamed Satan. That's very interesting. Not, not a fast, not a portion of the scripture of Job. Can you find Job make mention of the word devil or Satan? It's always God. God gave. He realized that everything he had was given to him by God. God gave. God has this sovereign power to take them off. God gave, God has taken them away. May his name be praised. He praised God even though he had taken everything he gave him. How many of us can turn around and praise God with everything we have, all our savings, everything gone? How many of us can say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Oh, I can't remember that. that would be funny. How many? That is the taste of Christianity. That is the test of you, how, how you have matured in your spiritual life. There are people, you take things away from them, you have taken their life forever. They will never see a church again, never see a Bible anyway. Not with Job. Job. Job said, in all this, I have not, I have not blasphemed the Holy One. That was a man who knew his God. And so when Job passed the testing, what happened? God multiplied, doubled, gave him double portion of what was taken away from him because he had now developed even greater capacity to handle more. I knew, I know, I know Satan would be, his, he, if there's something for heart attack, Satan would have had heart attack when he saw God giving him a double portion. He made him even, make him, he made him more upset to see Job, Job having more than he had before. Suffering, it's a good thing. It's a tool in the hand of God. Why do we push suffering away? Suffering, there are people who pray, oh, take the suffering away from me forever and ever, amen. If God were to take suffering away from you, you can never mature. 
write that down. If God takes suffering away from you, you will never mature. Again, suffering is God's way of preparing and perfecting his children for greater service and blessing. James 1 verse 2 through 4. James 1 through 4 and Hebrews 5, 8 through 9. You don't have to turn with me because our time is, is, is flashing. It's, it's flashing. Like I said, I have eight points. So you don't, I will be reading some of these passages, James 1, verse 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Consider it joy. Why? He tells you in verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect again, the word teda, oh, perfect, mature, and complete, lacking in nothing. That's what suffering does. It matures you, makes you presentable before God. Number three, no believer is exempted from suffering. No believer is exempted from suffering. R write these passages down. Some of them I will read, some I will not read. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, verse 22. That one I will read. Acts 14, 22. Luke tells us, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. You got that? Through many tribulations, through many sufferings, we, unless you are not among we. If you're not a believer, I'm not talking about you. But if you're a believer, you cannot escape suffering. Do it. The Bible tells us we enter into God's kingdom. Look at Romans. I will read that place too. If you can turn it, fine. But otherwise, whoever is faster, if you're faster, Romans 8, verse 17. And Paul tells the Romans, verse 17, Romans chapter 8, Paul is, Paul is going to tell us, verse 18, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. So if Christ suffered, if you want to be glorified, you cannot take suffering away. I, I wonder why when many people, Christians, especially many pastors, they look at fellow believers who are going through suffering. They say, no, brother, sister, look into your life. I don't think as a believer, you, you go through suffering. That's unbiblical. It's not biblical at all. Suffering is part of our spiritual heritage. It is part of our spiritual package. Paul said in Colossians, in Philippians, brother, chapter one, it's not only given that we will believe, but that we will also suffer. Suffering is part of our spiritual heritage. Verse 18, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. In other words, the suffering that we go through now is nothing compared to what God has in store for you. That should give you hope. That should give you uh, something to look forward to. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. Paul will tell them the same thing. Chapter 4, 17 and 18. For momentarily, light affliction is producing to, for us an internal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. <laughs> That's really funny. Uh, underline that word light affliction. While you, have the, while you have your finger on the word light affliction, turn to 
turn to Second Corinthians 11, Paul is going to give you his light affliction in Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse beginning from verse 23. Second Corinthians 11, beginning from verse 23. Paul gives us light affliction. At the servants of Christ, I speak as if insane. I am also in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times with that number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Huh? Paul says lightweight. You got it? He calls it lightweight. It's very light, a piece of paper, in comparison to what is to be revealed. My brothers and sisters, we should be looking forward beyond here. When we do, it will change the way we look at the plan of God. God has something more dramatic, more spectacular being laid out for you. And so whatever you have here, Paul sees, it, Paul sees it as temporary, temporary. Number four, in suffering, this is important, God cannot give us more than we can handle. In suffering, God cannot give us more than we can handle. First Corinthians 10 verse 13. He says that God cannot allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able to bear. But if, he, if it does happen, he promises to give you a way of escape. God always has a remote control. He knows the right temperature. He can tune down your suffering. He can tune it up, tune it down. He knows the right amount of temperature that will produce the result he desired in your life. Number five, God's orchestrated suffering. God's orchestrated suffering for blessing is bearable. That's very important. God's orchestrated suffering for blessing is bearable. In other words, Joe, James said, can't it join when you run into various trials or testes? What I'm saying here in number five, if God desires suffering to help you mature, that suffering is bearable. Why? You have the availability of, this, of the feeling of the Holy Spirit that produces in you peace. In the, in the midst of chaos, you experience peace like like no other. Peace, the peace of God, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he produces in you joy. And that's why Paul could say in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4, in 2 Corinthians 7, 4, quickly, if, if you left me, I will speak until morning. But pray, I don't do that. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4. Great is my confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. Feel the word feel there is in conjunction to the feeling of the Holy Spirit. I am filled with comfort. I am overflowing with joy in all our affliction. In other words, even in his suffering, Paul had abundant joy overflowing through the feeling of the Holy Spirit. And so when God is this, when God prepares suffering to help you advance you will be able to bear it. One way you know that you are bearing it is that you have peace, you have the joy, and you are not looking for, you don't want, you're not looking for rapture. You don't start, you don't start praying for rapture. There are people today, they, one suffering, they start praying for rapture. Rapture come today, today, let's go to heaven. 
God's orchestrated suffering for blessing is bearable. Hebrews 10, verse 35 through 36 tells us that he does is bearable. There he tells you to hang on to bear. Romans, Hebrews 12, verse 1. Hebrews 12, 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. I'll read quickly. Again, as my time is drawing near. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted in prayer. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, suffering, devoted in prayer. You're able to pray. You're able to devote yourself. You're able to persevere. Why? Because you have the ammunition available to you. You have the feeling of the Holy Spirit. You have the word of God that gives you hope. James 1, 2, 1, 12. It says those who endure get blessing through their suffering. James 1, 12. James 5, 11. Even though I've given you these passages, that's your homework. <laughs> Read them. James 1, 12. James 5, 11. 2 Timothy 4, verse 5. 2 Timothy 2, verse 12. And Revelation 2, verse 3. And by the way, just in case if you miss any of these passages, just in a few days, Brother Perry will put, will put this on, a, on YouTube. So you can still get the message. You can still re replay the message on YouTube. We have all our archives on YouTube. First Corinthians chapter four, verse 12. I'll read that one quickly. And we toil, working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. How many of you, when you are reviled, you bless the person? Or do you just say, God is going to give it back to you. And you use the language I don't want to use right now. When somebody crosses you, do you cross back? That is, the, that is the beauty of Christian life, living like Christ. Now, Paul is telling you, because they were trying to imitate Christ. Christ was in, back in 1 Peter 2. He was revived. He never revived back. He was insulted. He, was, he never insulted back. They slapped him. They didn't slap them back. They slapped him when he was even when he was being uh, evaluated or judged when they were looking at his case. The priest ordered him to be smacked. And somebody smacked him. He just simply said, is that how you do when you are judging somebody's case? Well, Peter tell, Paul tells us that when reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. Endurance. Number six. This is, this is where I can put my hand on my head and talk about this number six. Self-induced suffering is the most painful and unbearable of all suffering. Self-induced suffering is the most painful and and, and unbearable of all suffering. Why? Self-induced, you, you brought it upon yourself. It's one thing for somebody to hurt you, to injure you. It's another thing altogether to purposely hurt yourself. And of course, that's what we do when we live a life that is opposite to the plan of God for our lives. We injure ourselves. And I'm going to quickly read some passages. Bear with me. If I take extra five minutes of your time, we're almost in number eight. Number seven and eight is, is I'm not going to read, maybe the last one I read passage. I'll say it again, just in case you didn't write it. Self-induced suffering is the most painful and unbearable, unbearable of all suffering. Hosea 8.6, Hosea 8.6 says, you sow to the wind, you reap hurricane. You sow the wind, you reap hurricane. 
one person who saw the wind and reaped hurricane was David. I don't have to tell you what David did, you already know that. But let me just read you some of the passages he, he, he wrote when he was going through hell and earth. Psalm 31, Psalm 31 verse 10. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing and my strength has failed because of my iniquity and my body has wasted away. That's not a good description. 32 verse 3, Psalm 32 3. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. That's not good. That's not nice. 38 verse 3, Psalm 38 3. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thy indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. 39 verse 3, my heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. This is confession of a person who really brought suffering upon himself, self-induced misery for violating God's mandate. Number seven. This is also important. Since Jesus, our great high priest, learned obedience through suffering. Since Jesus, our great high priest, learned obedience through suffering. It makes sense if God subjects us to suffering in time. Don't you agree? I'll say it again. I'll say it again. Since Jesus, our great high priest, learned obedience through suffering, it makes sense if God subjects us to suffering in time. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. So if Jesus learned obedience through suffering, you can be sure we will not get VIP treatment. I'm not looking forward to VIP treatment from God, because I can't get one. That's why Paul said in his prayer, in Philippians 3, verse 10, that I may know him, that I may know him personally, that I may have intimate, personal experience with him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And he added to that, that I may also share in his suffering. Did, did we miss something? This was a man praying that he will suffer with Christ. No, that's prayer. Wow, we are too far from such men. Finally, number eight. Number eight, I'm sure I gave you, a, if I didn't give you a verse for number seven, it's Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. Finally, number eight, you're gonna like this one, and that's the one I'm gonna conclude with in suffering, God will be with us. In suffering, God will be with us. In your suffering as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, I'm talking about suffering for blessing, suffering that God brought into your life to help you develop spiritual capacity, in that suffering, God will be with you. But when you are suffering as a self-induced misery, God multiplies your suffering. Not because he hates you. Rather, he wanted to bring that suffering to guide you to come to a point of blessing. God wants to bless us. Remember, remember the prodigal son? God had to allow him to exhaust all the things he thought was holding him. Everything was gone. His service was gone. And he started eating big food. That's ugly. He wanted me, just to think of it, he wanted to throw, he wanted to throw up. Think of this man that came from a rich family. Now eating things, he gave the pigs, pigs, I'm not talking about pork, 
I don't know why you're giving the baptismal name pork. So it will sound so good, pork chop. Just call it pig chop. That's what it is, pig. And the, this man, he gave, he fed, he will feed the pork a little bit, the pig. I, I joined you to call it pork. He, he feed the pig a little bit, and then he'll take his own from the same plate. That's what can happen to anyone who walks away from the plan of God. Remember this man, this young man walked away from the family, walked away from where everything was available to him. He wanted to be his old man. I have grown. I can handle it. I can handle life. My dad always stopped me from enjoying the life I wanted to enjoy. My dad always, every time, Bible class, Bible class, Bible study, Bible study. I never have time for my friends. Just give me my portion. Let me go have my time. And go, uh, his father said, okay, if that's what he wanted, see you. And he took everything and squandered it on his friends. White light. Everything was gone. Nothing left. And the Bible tells us he came to his senses. And he said, I should go back to my father. That's a good thing we should do when we are out of line. We should return. Every time we return, God has his hands wide open to receive us because he's a God of mercy, compassion, and love. You can never out sin God. You can never out sin his grace. There is no failure on your part that is too great for the immense grace of God. None. Now, he's always waiting, full of compassion, full of love. And so finally, in suffering, God will be with us. And I'm going to read two passages, and we will close tonight. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, the first, the second part of verse 1, it says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. Have you been redeemed? Of course, if you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been redeemed. And the voice of God is speaking to you tonight. Do not fear. Don't fear anything. Don't fear what is the devil is throwing at you. Don't fear what you are going through as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't fear the, 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 the volume of suffering that you will face or will ever face. Don't fear. Don't be anxious about these things. God himself is saying to you, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by, your, by, by name. You are mine. So you're not just someone out there. You are actually God's child. When you go, when you go if, you, if you can grab God's palm, his, his, his hand, look, look closely on his palm, you will see your name engraved. That's what the Bible tells us in Isaiah, that I have engraved you on my palm. So God doesn't have to look on the shelf and look where your name is. All he has to do is to look on his palm. Your name is engraved. That's how close you are to God. You are mine. And in verse 2, when you pass through the waters, what that means here, suffering, I will be with you. He didn't say when you you will never pass through waters. God doesn't promise, promise that. But he said, when you pass through waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. They may, they may come close to your neck, but never your head. That's his promise. The river, you may be thrown into a river of suffering. God is telling you, this. I'm going to make sure that this water, this overflowing river, can only stop on your neck. You still have your nose to breathe, still have your mouth. They will not swallow you. Isn't that wonderful? Add to that in verse 3. And then, no, no, continue in verse 2. The half part of it says, when you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched. Nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. 
the one who saved you, Jesus himself, Jehovah, says in Matthew 28, Lo, I am with you even to the end. The same thing he says here, when you go through fire, any fire, any suffering. Remember the, the three Jews, the three Jews who were thrown in the fire? God never told them you will never be thrown in the fire. And they were willing to be thrown in the fire. I like what they said, even if my God does not deliver us, even if our God does not deliver us, we will not bow before your idol. And those three were thrown. The Bible never said they will not be thrown. They were thrown. Guess what? Jehovah was with them, making them the fourth people on the fire. Just as he promised. They were not scorched. Not even, not even uh, their, their, their clothes. Nebuchadnezzar was marveled. Did I not throw three people? How come they are four? Well, he, he, he acknowledged. The photo looks like God. You bet he was God. The God of Israel. The God of all ages. Our God. When you go through suffering, count on one thing. As he promised, he will not let you down. He will be with you. Why can't you us, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, take our spiritual lives seriously? Why do we miss all these blessings God has for us? Why? Why? God has tremendous blessings waiting to bless us, according to Isaiah 30, verse 18. Why are we cheating ourselves? And time is running out. As Paul tells us, we are closer to eternity than when we first began. Every day we draw nearer to eternity. Don't waste, your time. Don't waste away your time. Invest your time so that your time in your life in time will account for eternity. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this moment. Thank you for opening our eyes to your truth. Thank you for feeding us. Thank you for your unfallible word. Who are we that you have even considered to feed us this hour? Thank you for the Holy Spirit who taught us. And thank you for his enablement and helping me to deliver your word to your people for your glory. I'm so grateful. And so, Father, I pray that you will use this word to challenge us, that we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may grow and be beacon of light to our time and generation. And help us, oh God, help us as a church, not, not help us as churches all over the world. Quicken us, revive us as believers. For we are walking our way, further away, further and further every day from you. Be merciful, be gracious, draw us back to you, revive us, and we will be revived. Help us keep our hearts knitted in love. Help us to continue to take your word seriously. Let us help us to make it a priority in our lives to study and to grow in your grace day by day, that we may come to a point of glorifying you to the maximum. Challenge us. Keep us from the evil one. Keep us from temptation. Thank you, God. You have a plan that cannot be thwarted by the enemy. Thank you for this group, this wonderful group that tunes, tunes in every Wednesday night. Bless them immensely. Help them in every way. Cause them to grow to maturity, to a point of glorifying you in this life. Bless us all. Tonight, as we go to bed, grant that our sleep will be sound. In the morning, wake us up according to the riches of your grace, cause us to do whatever you may have for us. Let us do it with great joy, sharing in your happiness, in your peace. I lift my prayer in no other name than the name that you gave to us, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, our Savior, our Master, our Redeemer, our best friend, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.